Hi there, it's Dan Scott here, and I'm going to walk you through one of my recent paintings, Magenta Flowers, from start to finish. Here's the reference photo I'm painting from. I took this on a street around my parents' home in Brisbane, Australia. I'll leave a link for you to download the photo in the description. Feel free to paint it for yourself. I'll be using a mix of palette knives and brushes for this. The palette knives allow me to make distinct and clean strokes, whereas the brushes are better for blending and whenever I need more dexterity in my strokes. For the colours, I'm using titanium white, raw umber, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, viridian green, magenta, cadmium red, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, and cadmium yellow light. The surface I'm painting on is ampersand gesso board, which I prefer to use over canvas these days. It's a sturdy surface that works particularly well with palette knives. It's a fairly simple composition, so I don't bother with a preliminary sketch, instead I just start working directly onto the white surface. What I'm trying to do at the start here is to get a feel for the composition and to roughly map out the major shapes and colours. I start with the dark greens. I start most of my paintings with the darks, then work my way up to the highlights. I find that once I have the darks in place, I can better judge the other colours. My brushwork here is rough and relaxed. I'm really only focusing on colour and shape at the moment. All the other details and nuances can come later. But it is important that I get this foundation right before I proceed. Any mistakes I make at this early stage of the painting can compound into significant mistakes later. In terms of colour, I'm particularly focused on getting the value and temperature right. Value is how light or dark a colour is, and temperature is how warm or cool a colour is. I find these to be the more fundamental elements of a colour. The other element is saturation, which is how dull or vivid a colour is. I usually worry more about saturation later in the painting. Here you can see I'm making timid strokes to suggest the trees at the top. I'll often use timid strokes like these to test and explore an idea without overly committing in that direction. I find that as paint starts to build up, the surface becomes less and less responsive to my strokes. Once I've tested an idea and it seems to work, I'll commit in that direction with confidence and a loaded brush. I start blocking in the fence with a palette knife. This is one of the more challenging aspects of the painting. I need to make the fence dark enough to appear like it's in shadow but light enough to appear like a white fence. There's little room for error here. If my colours are just a touch too light, dark, warm or cool, the fence will look off. The colour I go with is a mix of ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, magenta and titanium white. There's also some viridian green in the mix from the paint that was already on the surface. I add some more colour variants at the top. I'm using broken colour here, with variations of green and yellow. What I'm trying to do is convey the idea of all these leaves, highlights, shadows and other details, without rendering every individual leaf. As I progress through the painting, I'll continue to build up layer upon layer of this broken colour, until it all works together in harmony. Whenever I have a new colour on my brush, You'll often see me place a few dabs around the leaves, or areas where I've used broken colour, to add even more variance, and to create subtle links between different areas in the painting. I move on to the light parts in the painting, starting with the road on the left hand side. One of the key features of this painting is the play between strong lights and strong shadows. There needs to be a sharp contrast between them, but they also need to work together as a whole. I use a palette knife to gently scumble colour over the surface, 
leaving parts of the bare white surface exposed. This gives a rough, painterly finish, and it mimics the flickering highlights you would see in life. I adopted this technique from Nikolai Fashion. If you don't know who this is, I suggest you take a moment after watching this video to explore his work. It's fantastic. I'll put some links in the description for you. I start painting the grass with light greens. If you look closely at my strokes, you'll see that each stroke contains several distinct colours that are woven together. To make these multicoloured strokes, I roughly mix a few colours together on my palette knife and leave them partially unmixed. These multicoloured strokes are particularly effective for conveying the idea of grass without having to do that much work. The downside is, these strokes are unpredictable and you'll often see me scraping them away and redoing them. For the sky, I use cobalt blue with a touch of titanium white. I need the sky to appear rich and vibrant, but also light in relation to the surrounding landscape. Unfortunately, our paints are limited in the sense the colours get weaker in saturation as we make them lighter in value with titanium white. This is a problem when painting a light source like a blue sky. It's impossible for me to mix a blue with the same brilliance and intensity as the sky itself because of this trade-off between saturation and value in our paints. As I add titanium white to cobalt blue, the blue gets lighter, but it also gets weaker and loses its intensity. The best I can do is create the illusion of a blue sky using contrast. Instead of trying to match the colour of the blue sky, I focus more so on the relationships between the sky and the surrounding colours. In most of my paintings, I make the sky a touch lighter at the expense of saturation, but in this case, the richness of the sky is a key feature, so I go with a darker, but richer blue. The colour is darker than what it needs to be, but that's a trade-off worth taking. I can also compensate for this by making the land a touch darker by comparison. For the magenta flowers, I roughly map out their position and colour, with the intention that I'll do more work on them later. I don't want to finish them now, as I want to have the rest of the painting in place before I decide on the final colours and brushwork. It's easier for me to make informed decisions about important parts of the painting like this when I have all the other parts in place. I spend a lot of time building up texture and broken colour for the leaves. Again, I'm not focused on painting individual leaves and details. Rather, I'm trying to use my strokes and colours to create the illusion of all the leaves, highlights, shadows and other details. This is harder than it sounds, and if I'm not careful, painting like this can easily turn into a muddy mess on the canvas. In the reference photo, notice how there's a parked car in the background. At first, I wasn't sure if I would include this car in the painting, but I decided to include it as it can act as a sharp, dark accent. Painting the car is tricky in that I want it to look like a car, but I also want it to look vague and as part of the background. If I use too much detail, it's going to look over-rendered and out of place. If I don't use enough detail, it's not going to look like a car. There needs to be a careful balance between these extremes. My solution is to try and see the car as an abstract arrangement of shapes and colours. I then paint those shapes and colours without thinking about what they represent. This way, I'll capture the broad foundation of the car without any of the intricate details. There's a bit of trial and error here. I'm not sure what strokes are needed, but I do roughly know what I want it to look like. So I make a few strokes, and if they don't work or if I overdo it, I scrape them away and I try again. If the strokes do work, 
I leave them and continue in that direction. I don't recommend this approach, but sometimes it's necessary. I start adding a few dark accents around the leaves. This gives the painting a bit more depth, and it helps the magenta flowers and the green highlights stand out by comparison. Remember, painting is all about relationships and contrast. If you want to make a colour appear stronger in your painting, you could make that colour brighter and richer, or you could tone down the surrounding colours and make them darker and weaker. Now that most of the painting is complete, I start refining the flowers. I focus mostly on colour temperature and the subtle relationships between light and shadow. Parts of the flowers are in direct sunlight, and I want to make these colours warmer in temperature than the parts in shadow. For the lights, I use a mix of magenta, titanium white, plus a touch of cadmium red or cadmium yellow to make the colour warmer. For the cool colours in shadow, I use a mix of magenta, cobalt blue, and titanium white. I'm also trying to make sure the flowers fit in with the rest of the painting. I want them to stand out, but still appear as part of the painting. I'm following my gut feelings for this. If it looks right, I leave it. If it looks wrong, I keep adjusting the colours and brushwork. There are a few important highlights that I need to capture on the fence. A common mistake here would be to use pure titanium white for the highlights, but that would look out of place. Light yellows and greens are more suitable. I tend to leave the brightest highlights like these until the end of the painting. If I paint them too early, then I find myself spending the rest of the painting trying to protect them. I also find it easier to judge what colours to use for the highlights when all the other colours are in place. A small but important detail is this area of negative space just above the fence. This burst of light and colour gives the area depth. Without it, the fence and the dark leaves would appear as one solid shape, and it would look too flat and rigid. I work my way around the painting and make a few final touches here and there. All the hard work is done by this late stage in the painting, and I'm just trying to give it to that finished appearance. I step back from the painting, judge it as a whole, and make minor adjustments as needed. When I can no longer find opportunities to improve the painting, that's usually a good sign that it's done. To finish, I sign the painting in the bottom left-hand corner, using magenta and a small round brush. Here's a photo of the finished painting. I'm happy with how it turned out. My main critique is that the sky is not rich enough. I won't fix it now, but it's something for me to consider for future paintings. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. I'll leave links to the reference photo and other resources in the description. Feel free to paint the scene for yourself. Just let me know how you go. If you want to learn more, make sure to join my newsletter that I write over at drawpaintacademy.com. I also have a four-part landscape painting workshop that you might find helpful. I'll put links to these below the video.